So here's another question that that I thought well kind of appealed to me was it was about sensors, and that's a lot of my my background. And this this is an example of a question that gives you some starter code or gives you essentially a library that you can use this up here and then ask you to implement the bottom portion. So I think a lot of questions follow this form where you get here's a library or library functions, macros, global variables, et cetera. Here's something that you can use in order to implement your code. And in this particular case, we are at least conceptually trying to write code that wraps around the library. So this function is provided by the library and our function, at least conceptually, is intended to wrap around that function. And I think a lot of other questions I've seen kind of follow that same pattern. Uh, for instance, uh, implement aligned malloc, such that every time you, alloc you call malloc, it's always gonna give you uh, an allocation that's aligned to an, I don't know, a 64 byte boundary. Uh, so you can kind of write a function that wraps around an existing function. So let's, let's dive into this one first before I go too philosophical on us. In this case, the function that we were given that's already implemented and that we don't need to do anything with other than use is a function called read next sample. And this function returns the next sample. In this particular case, the sample that well, the sensor that we're talking about is the ALS sensor, the light sensor. So we are going to receive a lux value from that sensor. Along with the lux value, we're also going to get a timestamp associated with when that uh, when that value or when that yeah when that value was created, and then also a status in case there was some sort of error in collecting that. So this read next sample is going to block and block here is the key one here. It's gonna block for up to one second and it's gonna return once the value changes from the previous iteration. So if you call read next sample, let's say right now when my light situation isn't really changing, we call read next sample, it's gonna return a value of, let's say, I don't know, it's probably around 300 lux in here. And it'll return that value, uh, I think, almost immediately, or fairly, fairly promptly, because there was no previous value. So it'll, it'll get the current value and return 300. The next time we call it, it'll block until that number changes. So as long as it continues to be the, the Lux value 300, it won't return. But if the value goes up to, let's say, 301, then read next sample was going to return 301. The exception here is that it's going to block for at most one second. So if a whole second goes by and the value never changes from the previous return value of 300, then it's going to return this no change status. This is what the function does that already exists for us. And what we want to do is implement a non-blocking version of that function. We want a function that will return effectively immediately every single time it is invoked with the most recent acquired Lux value. So let's focus on implementing this first. Get most recent Lux. Hopefully I've summarized this problem statement sufficiently given it what are people's initial thoughts how how might we go about implementing this function and what sort of data structures or other things are we going to need to create in order to accomplish it so so can you hear me yep <clears throat> i mean get most recent lux need not to be blocked that means you could just 
have a most recent value cached somewhere. So a background thread, which is reading the next sample and that is putting the, the sample value somewhere. Let's say let's a queue, right? Circular queue or a queue kind of data structure. Right? And then whenever the get most recent lux uh, calls, it just read, reads from the rare. I mean, the latest value from the, from the from the from the cached values, right? So the previously cached values and returns. And Excellent. Uh, and so I'm going to cut you off. You brought a couple of good points. I want to touch on them first. Maybe then I will give the floor back to you. Uh, the first thing you said was, well, we obviously can't call read next sample from within this get most recent lux function. But read next sample can block. So we, we can't call a blocking function from another function we intend to not block. So it has to be done in some other thread. So I think that, that was a good first observation is that read next sample has to be called from another thread. Uh, the next question is, well, what is that other thread going to do? So obviously we can spawn another thread, but at what time do we spawn the thread and what is the contents of that thread's main function? And what you said is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that that other thread that we've created will call read next sample, I, I presume in a loop, uh, and it'll cache the most recent value in some global variable. And this get recent lux will simply read and return that global variable. Right. I mean, if, if we did not have to implement the second API, uh... We, if we only had to implement the first API where we just need a recent value, then one global variable would be enough. Yeah. Yep. A absolutely. Uh, and yeah, all we have to return here is the float value. So all we would really need is a, a global float lux value. And of course, we would need to make sure we did it in a thread safe manner. So mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think the ideal case would be used using an atomic variable so that we can read and write to float safely. Uh, but we could also use a, a mutex uh, or even, even something like a, a spin lock if for some reason other primitives weren't available to us. So in some way, shape or form, we have to protect that global variable from when we read and write to it. But conceptually, that is what we would need to do. Right, I mean, if, if we had a, if we were, that global is a supplementary type, read would have been fine uh, with any time. It might just read the stale value if we are running into a risk condition. But but yeah, I mean, it's, it's always better to use atomic in that case. Yeah, oh, and, and uh, you, you, it's just something very interesting. And I, I mentioned this earlier as well, and I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize it again now too. And this is, this is a, a very, very common, I guess you'd call it misconception, very common mistake. Let's say we have some global bool value. And bools, as we know, are either going to have value zero or one. If in one thread value is being set to something, and then in another thread, we are reading value. It's commonly thought that the worst that happens, assuming value, this global value, this global value was not protected by a mutex or something else, the worst that happens is we read a stale state. In other words, this should always return either true or false. So the worst that happens is we get the opposite of what we had intended. And there's many cases where it doesn't matter. Like this Boolean value might just be, hey, there's something waiting on a queue. And if you accidentally check the queue when you didn't need to check the queue, well, it doesn't matter because you checked the queue, the queue was empty, and you essentially ignored that, that Boolean signal. The problem is, is that that isn't a global, it isn't a universally safe thing to do. Anytime you have one thread writing a variable and another thread reading a variable, 
there isn't a guarantee that you get a the old or the new value it's possible that you can get some other third intermediate value and not only that but because it's unspecified behavior it's also possible that the system could do something like crash or especially if you start writing things yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that unspecified behavior so a number of things could happen so a lot of people write code like this with a where they're having a boolean value where they kind of care what the value is but it's okay if the value is wrong but if we want to be technical about it even doing that isn't safe unless we have some sort of synchronization primitives protecting it uh, an unprotected variable even an unprotected boolean can still result in undefined behavior in the program where undefined might be something worse than simply getting a stale value so, so sorry to go on that slight tangent but i i wanted to to say that that it it's fine most of the time but technically speaking it it can cause issues sure uh, so the, the 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 other point to that right i mean assuming the data structure it's already defined as you in 60 64 t timestamp uh you might and generally atomic types are like it has its own type right i mean you might have atomic 64 underscore t or something like that so you, yep. you might have to, so the global that we will have in this case is just our own global which will be which will which will have the value copied from this timestamp on the sensor reading data structure right yeah that would be my assumption is that we would have our own global variable protected or atomic in some way shape or form and we would copy that copy the variable returned from get next sample into the global and then within our get most get most recent lux function we would we would retrieve that global variable yeah and, and if it the if this uh this function's uh, signature got changed let us slightly saying instead of a float it, it tends to return a sensor reading and in that case uh, you atomic won't help so how do you do a non-blocking operation a spin lock would be okay or i don't know i uh, there's a couple ways you could go about it you could i uh, well let's assume that all three of these values need to go together so you couldn't simply say well, make an atomic int an atomic float and an atomic timestamp because then you might have the problem that when the function returns a structure you might have an inconsistent set of those so all three of those need to be essentially saved together atomically one approach you could take for that is by using mallet so you could have an atomic pointer an atomic pointer to this structure and call mallet save the value that's returned from get next sample save that entire structure and then atomically update the pointer to your new pointer and then free the old pointer such that at well freeing the old pointer you need to be careful about that too but at least in theory uh you can use pointers to solve that problem the, the, and that's again, with pointers you have to make sure you don't free something before they're actually done the previous person might be still using it so maybe you'd store the most recent two copies so that it's always going to be be safe but there's, there's ways to solving that problem uh but using atomic pointers is, is, a, is a possibility for solving that as well uh and then another possibility which it would be a little bit tricky but but doable is on some systems you do have uh you do have uh how's it stand standard std atomic uh i believe it's two underscores int 128 uh, on some systems you do have int 28 as a data type so you could at least conceivably uh squeeze all three of these things together into 128 bits and then save that as a single value 
And then on the retrieve side, read that atomic 128 bits all at once, and then separate it back out into the component values, which might be as simple as a cast to the struct or might need to be fancier, uh, some separate mem copies. But in either case, if you have this structure being 128 most likely in size, you should be able to use 128 bit atomic type if that's available to you on your system. Okay, uh, this next, the next thing that asks you to implement, I think it's hopefully fairly, fairly obvious how we might go about doing this. Uh, if we need to keep a history of all of the previous values. So this is saying, not don't just get me the most recent one, get me the value at a particular timestamp. That means that we can't have a simple, single atomic variable or single protected variable that we, write and read from. We now need either an array or a queue of a linked list of some kind uh, to maintain that and then iterate through when we're requested. Arrays would obviously be the simple choice. The problem with an array is that you have kind of a, a finite size you specify at compile time for how large that array is going to be. So you would need to make sure that your array were sized appropriately so that it was always going to be longer than the number of seconds that this process might be running. Uh, otherwise, you could use, once again, a linked list or some other sort of container to keep all of your history and then query that container to get the values as requested. So I'm not going to go into the code for that. Hopefully, it's it's reasonably self-evident how one would go about doing that and that you would have some sort of mutex that protects the container and then your new thread will be inserting entries into that container and your get lux at function would be inspecting that container and retrieving the values as appropriate. You would also probably need to have some error checks such as if someone requested a timestamp in the future or requested a timestamp that you don't have in your database, you would need to return an appropriate error code uh, as opposed to crash. So some edge cases like that you would need to check for, but hopefully nothing too conceptually complicated. So uh, Glenn, uh, one point here, I, I have seen this question. So this question asked like, you only need to return this timestamp that uh, you you might get is only last 10, 10 minutes of worth of data so you probably just just summary might be fine i guess uh, um, instead of uh, yeah but but it, it's finite saying you don't assume it's an emulate system you know you have finite memory you you only can keep so much data right so that's a good point. Yeah, I think as it was posed to me, I don't recall there being a limit, but yes, uh, in an ideal world, you'd be given a limit for how much history needs to be kept, and then an array would, would be a more obvious choice to use. Glenn, another question here. Like, yep. if you don't have the atomic instruction available to you, say, for example, so in that case, uh, how do we handle this? Like, you... Uh, sure. So what I've been saying, I've been kind of being a bit hand wavy saying you need to protect your global variable or global array. And in, a to in, in, in the case of a single value, I think atomic is the easiest thing to do. From my perspective, if I'm writing code, especially in the context of an interview where it's just easy to make mistakes, I would feel most confident doing it using an atomic variable because there's just fewer things to get wrong in a sense. Uh, but you're right, if you, don't have, if, a, if you don't have atomic variable support on your system, how else would you do it? And then your most likely next option that you'd be most familiar with is using a mutex such that when you read or when you, when you get the value back from the read next sample function, Mm -hmm. You lock the mutex, you update your global variable, or you insert that variable into your global array and then unlock the mutex. And similarly, 
when someone calls either of these functions, you lock the mutex, look up the value that's being requested, and then unlock the mutex. But the only point that I have here is if they have to be non-blocking, if you're going to pick a mutex in those functions, we are essentially blocking it there, right? If we don't get the ah, mutex. That is an excellent question. Um, this kind of then comes down to what's the definition of blocking? Yeah. Uh, and this might be something worthwhile to clarify with the interviewer. And I didn't even think about that. So this is good you brought it up. When I hear non-blocking, what I interpret that to mean as this function is going to return promptly uh, mm -hmm. in a kind of deterministic and, and short period of time. Uh, this up here is both not short and not deterministic because it could be any time between zero and one second. So mm -hmm. when, when I think of non-blocking, I think of once again, something that is, is, is always going to be, uh, well, even short isn't really the best way of putting it, but something could be non-blocking and still take a long time, uh, but it's not gonna be blocked for an extended period of time based off of something you don't have control over. Uh, so yes, it may be blocked for a short period of time as the read next sample is locking the mutex and updating the value and then releasing it. But because updating the value is a kind of constant time operation and it should be a very short period of time that it's locked, uh, I would consider that to be non-blocking. However, you bring up a point that uh, if, for example, this is a, this you are trying to call this code, let's say in an interrupt context where you you are prohibited from acquiring any sort of lock, let's yeah. let's say, uh, then my definition of non-blocking would not be sufficient. Uh, so, so, so to put it in a different way, like what you think is a problem if you don't like you protect your queue where you're putting the data into the data that you get from read next sample you put that into a queue the queue is locked but the one variable that you return what happens if you don't lock that variable i'm just throwing it out there like what happens in that case uh, you know i'm not quite sure i follow you can you say that once more so the queue where you're storing your last 10 minutes of data you yep. lock that queue while you update your data but uh, I think there was another part to this question. We, we took this question up in our study group. Uh, so oh, okay. yeah, the, there was another part to this where the very first call should, should will always be non-blocking. So the very first call to read next sample will not block at all. You will get the value. So at any point in time, if you that global variable that you're going to return will have a value. So what what do you think might go wrong if you don't lock that using a mutex? Your queue is, you can protect your queue, but not that variable. Like at any point, whenever you get the get most recent lux is called, mm -hmm. you just return the global's value. Don't bother whether it is like. Yes, and this was what I was trying to get at here before with my discussion of this Boolean. And the point I was trying to make that uh, reading a variable in one thread that is being written to concurrently and simultaneously in another thread, mm -hmm. when, you, when you read that variable, you, you could get any value back. It's, it's not just like you're gonna get either the, the old value or the new value. You could get any value back, uh, in many of which being invalid or, or nonsensical. Uh, so, if you didn't have any protection over that global variable, when you tried to read from it, you could be getting nonsense. So, so uh, here is one thought. I mean, uh, I mean, you could you could have that for the first API to win. Not, and and by the way, for my interpretation of non-blocking is it cannot go to sleep. Uh, oh. That's that's my interpretation. Uh, I mean, you could you could spin maybe, but that thread cannot go to sleep. So, but anyway, that keeping that aside, like first API get most recent lux was problem was solved, right? Atomic, you keep an atomic uh, for the last sample, that's fine. When now we are, we are trying to move the second API get lux eight, would 
was that and and it's also suggesting okay we only need to keep 10 minutes worth of data we can keep a circular queue which which will override the older data when when the when that 10 minutes of once once we get past to the 10 minute right so then we will we'll get the samples which will override the older time stamps uh, in that case are and and this is supposed to be a, a non blocking call are we suggesting a kind of like a lock free queue kind of data structure here uh, uh, so yeah a, a lock free queue would would obviously would be a a reasonable approach obviously a lock free array well, sorry, using atomic variables, of course, but you could do the same thing using an array. If if you had atomic variables, but and you and you didn't want to use a mutex for for whatever reason, uh, you could use the atomic variable support to control access to your array. Uh, because once again, your your array, what you're essentially going to have when you have an array is a uh, an array of, of values that are the history, and then a singular index indicating the where the most recent value lives. I'm assuming it'll be essentially treated as a circular buffer, this array. So you need to keep track of where the most recent value is, and then you can can retrieve it. Uh, although I suppose if you're also saving the timestamp, then I suppose maybe you don't need an index, you would just iterate through the array to find the timestamp that corresponds with what was requested uh, in the case of the second function. Uh, I have yeah, to think a little, yeah. little bit more. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I think that that's, that's, that's a good point, right? I mean, um, would that timestamp would map to a direct index or would that timestamp uh, would record a linear search to the array, right? So, um, and, and, uh, Product doing a lock free queue and iterating through all the samples and find the appropriate timestamp that is requested might be. I'm not sure whether that would yeah. work or not. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was just thinking about the array and and it, if you treated your array, if, if your array was an array of atomic variables, where each entry in the array was a tuple of the timestamp and the associated value. You could obviously pick an arbitrary entry in the array, atomically read that entry, and then check, oh, is the timestamp match what it was that was requested? And you could implement some sort of algorithm, but you know that your array is ordered. You could essentially uh, pick, guess the item in the middle, is that higher or lower than what you're looking for? And then kind of narrow down in a, in a log n sort of manner of the entry you ultimately are looking for that matches the timestamp you're given. And at any given point, all you're doing is atomically reading entries in your array, which is safe to do. So that'd be a way of getting rid, not having to have a mutex and not having to have a index uh, that keeps track of where the most recent one is or where, where things might happen to be, just have an array of atomic variables. Or uh, okay. can have uh, we can have an array like for example particular system uh, requirement is like let's say we can store ten different values we can divide that into five and five and have a ping pong buffer so one will be reserved for writing another one is reading so you can read uh, from a first array which is not actually writing right now so that won't require a, you know like uh, too much weight uh due to the lock but if we end up you know a uh, reading from the other part of array where we need to lock it so that nobody can write it and then we can read it quickly so i mean well so I, I i think i see what you're getting but the problem there is that you you would still need a mutex or some sort of lock to make sure that whatever whatever buffer you're reading from isn't also being written to at the same time. So you would need to lock one or the other of those ping pong buffers when you're reading it to make sure someone doesn't write to it. Uh, and once, what, when, once, you, once you have to lock it, then well, you might as well have just had a single buffer or a single array as opposed to having two of them. 
if i understood your your premise yeah correct. so what i'm getting yeah yeah uh, that that is okay too uh, the reason i was like proposing ping pong is uh, you can reserve half of the array to you know just writing so the rest of the array doesn't need a log because it's not being written like that particular part of the array is not being written and then you can like search whenever you time so you reduce the latency i mean you actually make it half the latency uh, you so what I'm you're saying. saying is have an array that's twice as large as you need it to be such that the X number of seconds that you're required to maintain are always there and yes. you have additional space where old stuff essentially lives around longer than it needs to on the off chance that someone was trying to, to read it and got delayed for some reason. That's right. So if you need, let's say, for example, you need, uh, sorry, you can store maximum 10 uh, numbers uh, in the array. So let's divide it in five and five. And then other five, which will be your, uh, one of the ping pong buffer, which is actually busy in the writing. Another one is free to do whatever you want to. So you're reducing the latency too. Uh, I, I, I think... I think you're right in that that could work from a from a multi-threading perspective. We could ensure some type. We can ensure some safety with regards to uh, not reading something that is concurrently being written to. But I would still have a concern about the most recent sample being inserted into the array. Uh, how would you make sure that no one tries to read that until it is fully written? Glenn, what another quick uh, question here. So the whole read next sample uh, is going to be called only by one thread, right? So yes, we and everything we've talked to, about so far, yes. Yeah, it's because there's only one window there. And uh, the, all the API calls that's going to happen is that they, I mean, like multiple threads can call this API. They get most recent Lux and all that. So the queue, I I don't see why we need to protect the queue as it is. So at some point in time, your other thread is going to need to insert a new entry on the queue, whether it be a linked list or array or whatever it is, a new entry would need to be added to it. And potentially an old entry would need to be removed, depending on if you have extra space that you're reserving or not. You need to make sure that the other thread, which is calling this function, the other thread is going to and... read the global, right? It's not going to read the queue at all. The queue is internal to this thread that we are spawning. Well, so in this case, we have a function called get lux at. So I'm assuming that there's a queue of, of historical lux values. Mm -hmm. And whoever okay. calls this get lux at would need to, to access the queue. Search. Yeah. OK, OK, yeah. For the second API, yes. Yeah, yeah. So if we only had the first API, that would obviously change some things a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you have to implement the second one, then well, it makes makes the world a little bit more complicated. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, so having having a mutex to protect it obviously would would do the trick. Uh, using an array of atomics, I, I think I, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. Uh, assuming you, you had to obviously write the code correctly, but uh, we should be able to do that ju just fine from an atomic perspective. Uh, and yeah, using one more thought with regards to over allocating the array, whether you want to call it a ping pong buffer or not, uh, I'm not 100% convinced that it would work, although obviously I think it might require a bit more thought and in getting into the details to see exactly how it would or wouldn't work. But my other concern there is that, well, we're talking all about embedded systems here, where part of the definition of an embedded system is that you're limited in terms of how much memory you have. So I would be, if I, if I needed to, in the context of an interview or real life, needed to uh, convince, convince management why I needed twice as much memory and memory costs money because it's going to be a bigger die and there's there's an expense that goes goes along with having more memory. Why am how am I going to justify needing significantly more memory 
just so I can get around a a uh, let's call it a race condition. Yeah, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely uh, not easy or shouldn't be actually when try to convince management. But what uh, what I was saying is like you know you already can store only ten, just divide them just for the sake of latency and not that's all right just for the sake of latency so what i did in one of my project uh implemented c plus plus based architecture for uh some ble thing so what i did was similar i think this is kind of a common problem so uh you have a circular buffer of certain number of readings that's like you know has a mutexes and all the all the logs when you read and write and then what you do is you have a separate uh, buffer where you keep on storing all these you know finalized values like in the chunks of data like 2k of you know blocks and whatnot and then when you request like get the most recent lux or whatever or get lux at say same and say a, a certain uh, timer you first search in your offline storage like 2k buffer or whatever where you are like keeping that thing and if you couldn't find it then you go and log the circular buffer because it's writing the very current and recent values on that circular buffer. Uh, so you log that uh, resource and then read at particular timestamp and then release it immediately. So uh, you distribute that uh, <clears throat> latency and also the locking mechanism. Yes, and, and I, I, I suppose I agree with you in the sense that, that that sounds like a reasonable solution, but I think I have two concerns with that. Uh, one is, latency is obviously important but consistency or jitter if you will is oftentimes even more important like it, it sometimes bear with me sometimes is more important that an operation always takes the same amount of time that's more important than it being faster some of the time and being slower other of the times so just just reducing the best case latency isn't always worth the trouble if what you're concerned about is the worst case latency. And, it, and in this case, I don't think it would improve upon the worst case latency, if, assuming I understood it correctly. Uh, my second concern is if you have to write code that can, if you have to have two different code implementations to like, here's the fast path, and then if not, go to the slow path. My concern always is, well, now you have twice as many places to have bugs you also have code that isn't going to run as often and is hence more more likely to have bugs because it doesn't run as often it doesn't get a chance to you don't get a chance to run into those bugs as often so that'd be kind of my my practical concern on that front and with regards to to things like timestamps or things that are sequential in ordering there's oftentimes other algorithms that we can take to very quickly find the entry that we're looking for that might beat out these other approaches that we could take. So if it was just a collection of unordered data, unsorted data, then yes, uh, it would be harder for us to, to optimize that lookup. And then maybe having multiple places uh, based off of history of when it's, I don't know, some sort of logic uh, could improve upon it. But if we, yeah, in this case, we know the timestamps are ascending. We know that they're in order. Uh, we, we can likely take advantage of those facts to optimize our lookup. So not to, not to negate or, or uh, minimize your, your suggestions. I, I think it has some potential, uh, but my, my, those are some of my concern, my, my kind of gut instinct concerns with hearing that. And I suppose in an interview context, uh, those would be the follow-up questions I would ask of, of, in addition to like seeing the code or seeing the design, asking you kind of those philosophical questions, if you will, those, those performance questions of how do we, why is this the better approach than something else and asking for a justification? Uh, all right, we're over time, but uh, any other questions or thoughts at this point? I, I don't I want to make sure we kind of hopefully close out on this discussion before we close out on the session tonight. I, I was just going the, through the preparation, no, not preparation, but the uh, uh, the material. And then 
here in the question it's asking non blocking and while it's doing the return as float generally non blocking needs the registration of uh, some kind of you know function pointer or something like that so is what do you think about that uh, I, i'm i'm not quite sure I, i'm not sure i understand what you're saying about a function pointer so uh, it says non blocking and thread safe right mm -hmm. so the gate most recent lux is generally in the non blocking call you return immediately and then you get back with uh, whatever value uh, you have uh, sure. later later right here oh, oh. you see so the function the signature seems to be messed up here uh yes yeah, so uh, i guess another way of calling that would be synchronous versus an asynchronous function yeah yeah i uh, where if this was an asynchronous function what get most recent lux would do is essentially register a request to be given at some point in time in the future a the most recent value uh and that actually is an interesting interpretation of this question because that that conceivably could be a way of not maybe the historical get lux act but at least this get most recent lux that could be a potential way of solving this of saying you know what i'm going to change this function prototype to be a registration function like we talked about on sunday and then callers can get the data via callback um that is so that that's a a potentially valid way of doing it i'm going to talk about that in just a second but in the context of this interview question since they gave you the prototype that you're supposed to implement get most recent lux uh it would be my assumption and you can always follow up with them on this uh that that prototype needs to stay as it is and if they didn't provide for a callback mechanism that probably isn't what they were looking for uh but i don't think there's anything wrong with asking the interviewer like hey it, am i allowed to change the prototype of the function i'm supposed to implement uh and that's not just for this question but questions in general some some interviewers and some questions will will lend themselves to like oh yeah sure if you want to change those data types or add additional fields you might be given that permission in this particular case i uh, an asynchronous implementation is probably not what the interviewer is looking for and probably wouldn't give you the go ahead to do it yeah i think it's it's a good point i mean you you could i mean as you said if it's an async call generally callbacks are registered and callback but in this context the the i mean generally the async call is you 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 do some operation you you try to get the recent data from that operation and that's why you register a call that from but in this context any last any previous lux i mean the most recent lux is good enough right so that's why uh, you 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 don't need to trigger an operation and wait for that result to come in right so that's why probably callback is not given yeah so hopefully that addresses your i think i feel that was peru and i hope that addresses your your question of like why is this function prototype what it is and well it's it is what it is because it's not intended to be an async operation uh but maybe there is a world in which turning it a into an async operation is a reasonable kind of solution to the problem hey glenn this is a amazing um silly question mm -hmm. given this problem are you producing a running code um not knowing what os what the lock signature is blah etc cetera, etc cetera. are you running just pseudocode are you just um having a discussion a thought process exchange um uh, what is I the think, manifestation of this problem i guess yeah in the i think setting? i think i actually cut out part of the, the pro part of it i think there were a couple other lines here that gave uh some functions you could call like mutex lock and mutex unlock and so on so this the way that this was worded especially how it was worded before i cut some lines out to make it fit on one on one page strongly indicates that they're expecting you to write a complete and working implementation of this function in the sense that it is going to call some potentially unimplemented functions so they're not necessarily going to expect you to have 
the the POSIX or whatever whatever the the library is for threading on the system. They're not necessarily going to expect you to have those memorized for how to create a mutex, lock, unlock it, how to spawn a new thread. Uh, they're probably not going to expect you to have that memorized. And in this particular case, they gave a they gave some functions that you could use in this case for mutexes to do what you needed to do. And in general, if you're given something that you're if you're supposed to implement this and then they gave you they didn't give you the prototype for how to, to lock a mutex it is usually a safe thing to say like hey do you have a prototype or can i just use some pseudocode here because especially if your code isn't going to compile as long as you get your point across that like you want to lock something and there's some object that you're locking and it's a realistic sort of c or c plus plus sort of interface that should be just fine so anyway so to answer your question yes i would expect you to actually need to implement this code but no it might not be something that can be compiled because it might rely on uncompiled helper functions that they're providing